So we're absolutely delighted um, to have Hannah Sweetapple, Tom Briggs and Miranda Stern with us today. Um, thank you to all of you um, for participating. I just noticed we've got a spelling mistake in Miranda's name. Sorry, it's Stern with an E-A-R-N. Um, so thank you to all of them for all their hard work preparing for today. Right, so just to give you an update on our schedule. So um, we've done the introductions and housekeeping. We're just going to now move forward with a little bit of um, background information um, that Devon and myself are going to present. And then straight into our case studies. Um, as I've mentioned, we've got Hannah, Tom and Miranda. And we do have a little comfort break and um, that should be around 11 o'clock. So um, don't worry, there will be time to go and refresh your tea and um, have a comfort break. We're going to then have one session of questions. Um, so if you have questions for us, for the speakers, please do pop them in the chat. Um, Devon will be monitoring those as we go. So don't, you know, and then, and then she'll kind of raise the key questions in that slot. Um, we're then going to um, be zoomed out into breakout groups. So if you haven't done this before, um, it will ask you to accept that you're going into a breakout group. So click accept. And then um, we'll be in five groups of about 18. And one of us, one of the speakers that you're hearing from today will be in each of those groups to kind of guide the questions. We've just got some simple questions about what have you heard? What have you learned? You know, what you're going to take forward from this session and then we'll just come back as a group um, just for um, a little bit of feedback and any kind of final questions so aiming to finish at 12 o'clock so um, as we started late I hope everyone doesn't mind if we kind of a little bit of slightly over like five minutes over brilliant next slide and Devon oh so this is just to give you an overview of the learning outcomes so we're um, intending that you'll feel more confident about developing remote learning resources and learn from the case study examples, um, that you'll also understand how to adapt your school visits to be secure and um, that you'll um, have some learning from um, the examples from the Fitzwilliam Museum and also space for learning guide, guidelines and that you'll also be able to participate in this sort of supportive network with other professionals so you can um, see this as a safe space to ask questions um, and learn from each other. So Devon is going to just give us a little bit of background on remote learning. Yes, so, so we've all been hearing remote learning, blended learning, what is all of this? Um, so, you know, a basic definition to start off is that remote learning occurs when the learner and educator or source of information are separated by time, distance, and therefore cannot meet in a traditional classroom setting. Now, this certainly applies to uh, any kind of lockdown situation. You wouldn't call that maybe a typical setting. And so, um, lots of the remote learning that's occurred, you know, you might just think digital, we're talking physical as well, people mailing things um, to food banks and participating in a very physical way as well. Um, so it can be both digital and as well as physical. Um, information is typically translated via technology. Um, so email, discussion boards, video conference, um, so that no physical presence in the classroom is required. Otherwise, it would be what um, is called hybrid or blended learning. Um, and remote learning is often referred to as distance education virtual instruction or remote training. So in the future, if there's a, a, a sort of model where there's a bit of presence in the classroom as well as virtual, that would be a blended learning model. Um, and we have seen some of those coming out recently. Some further definitions. Um, this is a, a bit uh, what we just covered, but uh, blended learning is in the classroom. Hybrid learning, on the other hand, is teaching remote and in-person students at the same time via virtual uh, instruction solutions. Remote learning, again, can be access to physical materials and instructions sent out to participants. Um, and this method has been used by museums, galleries, and heritage sites during lockdown, um, some of which we'll be hearing about today. Museum remote learning can include webinars, online activity packs, digital and print resources, printable worksheets, curator and education talk videos, online tours, Facebook live presentations, and interactive video calls. We uh, have just collected um, some great examples of remote learning in the submissions for our new case studies on remote learning, which will be coming out uh, to members in October and the public in November. Um, and we've been very impressed by the breadth of uh, what's been happening in the sector. 
And on that note, um, just to share some museums to watch for remote learning, um, we've seen some wonderful things from a Jewish Museum London um, with their virtual classrooms. Um, we did some webinars uh, in July and August with Francis Jean there, who is our London rep. Um, and they've just been doing some really wonderful digital safeguarding practices, as well as looking at how to bring a very nice sensory aspect into um, remote learning. Leeds Museums and Galleries have been doing a lot with loans boxes, as well as their museum from home videos. So do keep an eye on uh, what they're doing. Uh, Historic Environment Scotland has been doing some wonderful things with digital and remote learning as well. Um, same with Colchester and Ipswich Museums. And Westminster Abbey, they've been doing some um, really interesting things with um, early years and family learning, um, especially around sort of half-term activities, holiday activities. So do take a look at, um, at what they're up to as well. They've got a great digital learning team. Okay, so that is my whistle stop tour. Um, there will be, as I said, new information um, and new case studies from GEM within the next couple of months. And we're always highlighting best practice, um, but I'll, pack it, I'll pass it back over to Rachel now to speak a bit about new surveys and guidance. Brilliant. Thank you, Devon. Just, um, just to give you an update, some of you may have seen the information that's been coming out about um, these two brand new initiatives. Um, we um, had kind of discussions amongst um, the GEM community around some kind of survey of schools and then we actually discovered that the, the bridge organisations in England were already preparing a survey. So we felt it wasn't much point us kind of replicating that process, but we, you know, we now have the results of that survey, um, which we can learn from. And um, I'll try and sort of pop it in the chat um, if you want to have access to the document, the report that's been produced. Um, on that. There's also an equivalent in Scotland. Um, I'm not really aware that any kind of large scale serving of schools been happening in Wales or Northern Ireland as yet. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of the themes coming through are that, you know, physical visits may, may not happen for some time, although there could well be local regional differences, you know, many schools um, that are academies or independent, you know, might take a different view. But I think as a general rule, it's looking like visits may not come back until next spring. Um, and in the meantime, it's really important that everybody has a digital offer and that there is a, and that moving forward that we actually start providing digital as, as another option. So there's an, there's an option around outreach, option around digital and an option around physical visits and that they can be um, interchangeable. Perhaps that's the model that the Jewish Museum have adopted. Um, also, just wanted to let you know very quickly that we've been working with the Claude Duffield Foundation, Engage, and a number of heads of learning across the UK to create some um, COVID secure guidance um, for learning spaces and museums. And that is now live. You can access it on the Space for Learning website um, and it will be updated, you know, as time goes on. So do have a look at that. It covers all sorts of different aspects, including very practical aspects around cleaning and social distancing um, what have you so it's been a really good process to have been working with Claw on that lovely so so it's it's the website is actually called space for learning I'll try and get the link up in the chat for you Laura um, brilliant so we'll now move on um, without further ado to our first case study and um, Hannah Sweetapple is actually one of our reps in Wales and um, she's based at the Egypt Centre, Swansea University. She's going to talk to us about what she's been doing to um, support remote learning um, during lockdown, but also how she's approaching developing a new online school service for, at the Egypt Centre. Thank you, Hannah. So just to remind you all that once Hannah's um, shared her PowerPoint, um, it's probably best to select speaker view, so you just see Hannah and her PowerPoint. Hi everyone, um, so I'm just sharing my PowerPoint. Um, can everyone see that? Brilliant. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, hi everyone, um, thank you to Jem for asking me to talk today. Um, I feel like I'm gate crashing a little bit because I am not in the southeast of England. I'm coming to you from a quite a dreary Cardiff, but I am based in the Egypt Centre in Swansea University. 
Um, just to give you a little bit of background of it. Um, so we're a university museum. We are based on, in Swansea University campus and we've been open since 1998. Um, we are Wales's only museum of Egyptian antiquities um, and we're also the largest collection of Egyptian antiquities with over 5,000 objects. And we're a very dirty museum, we're very small. Uh, we're six members of full-time staff, but over a hundred volunteers. Um, and so learning team, there's me, I'm the learning and engagement officer, and I've also got one learning facilitator. So a very small learning team. Um, to give you a little bit of background before COVID, I think would probably uh, be important. So our most popular service was our school visits. Um, we, they, we were fully booked for months, um, you know, so I had the lovely task uh, first week of lockdown of ringing around all the schools uh, the rest of the year cancelling them. Um, and it was also the museum's largest income generator, which I think is quite important to note. Um, we also had quite a successful loan box service um, and this, uh, you know, would send uh, loan boxes out to England um, and North Wales as well, people who couldn't physically visit us. Um, and we also did a lot around family learning. Um, we had craft activities, workshops, talks. Um, and the one thing that I haven't written down here is we had um, our award winning Saturday workshops, our young Egyptologist workshops, where we worked with schools. Um, so there were two Saturdays a month and they, uh, schools would refer children who might need a little bit of educational enrichment. I suppose the ones we'd call sort of hard to reach, um, but I really don't like that term. Um, and, you know, this, this all stopped <laughs> quite suddenly. Um, so we officially closed the public on the 18th of March um, and everything stopped. Um, all our income dried up and, you know, I think like a lot of people, I was sort of sitting at home like, oh, okay, what next? And lockdown actually started for me personally quite abruptly because um, I am asthmatic and I worked the, I worked the Saturday and uh, I was supposed to have the Monday off on, in lieu. And so I was, you know, minding my own business on the Monday and I got a call from my line manager saying that uh, occupational health had not cleared me to come back into the museum. Um, which was a bit of a shock because I wasn't shielding, you know, I was, but, you know, I think they were being more, more safe than sorry. So um, I had no time to sort of grab everything. Um, I had, you know, and due to the nature of our collections, it's a welcome collection. Um, we, I couldn't take anything home. I couldn't grab a loan box e either. Um, and I, I live in Cardiff, um, the rest of the team lived in Swansea and suddenly we're all on lockdown and no one could come up to Cardiff or me down to Swansea uh, with, with the loan box. And we didn't have any online provisions before this. I think it's really important to suggest, um, not from lack of wanting to do them, but um, we are a very small team and, you know, time, you know, we don't have time for everything. And so they just weren't prioritised. Okay, so I thought it would be best if I sort of take you through the sort of things we've been doing uh, while on lockdown, which sort of, they all sort of build together to paint the picture of what we're going to be doing for schools in September. Our first, the first thing um, we did was we wanted to create a sort of hub for all our resources and so we used our website to do this. Um, as I mentioned, I was, I spent my first days of lockdown ringing around schools saying, oh. yeah, sorry, I'm going to have to cancel your visit. But we also decided to use this as an opportunity to have a bit of a conversation with the teachers because schools weren't closed yet, but it was looking like that was going to happen. Um, so we use this to have this conversation and say, what do you want from us? You know, you, you're doing ancient Egypt as part of, you know, your curriculum and you know it looks like you're going to be doing it from home what what do you need what support do you need and I think it's also important to note here that ancient Egypt isn't actually on the Welsh curriculum it was removed in 2004 but people still find a way to fit it in because I think they really enjoy it um, so it's usually um, used as like a part of you know uh, Wales and the world it's uh, brought in where they compare you know life in Wales to cultures of the past um, so 
we're, um, due to our staff capacity, so me and um, the learning facilitator, it was just impossible for us to go straight to online facilitation. Um, you know, I, I did have people in the museum saying like, why don't you just, you know, throw something together and then we can fix it later. And that's, that's not how I roll. Uh, you know, I have a, a philosophy that if you're going to do something, you do it once and you do it properly. Um, and, you know, I could have rushed something, but no. Um, and so I think for me, sort of managing others' expectations was a very important part of this process because, you know, none of us, let's be honest, at the start of lockdown knew what we were doing. It came as a bit of a shock to all of us. Um, so I've got here a little picture of our learning from home page. And so we just decided very early on that all these were going to be free. They're going to be things that you don't need any specialist equipment for. Um, they are free to download in both English and Welsh. Um, and on the page currently, there are 12 activities. And we sort of split these into sort of informal and formal learning. So you had the things with, the, you know, links to the curriculum that teachers could download and send to their class. But we also had things like our craft activities, colouring sheets. Um, someone uh, used the term boredom busters the other day, and I quite like that. So, you know, th things to do, which we were, we were all looking for. Um, this has been quite successful. Um, we've been in contact with Swansea City Council and they have been directing teachers and pupils to it. And I think that link was really quite invaluable for us because, you know, um, you know, you can put stuff out on social media and, you know, advertise it that way. But it was impossible for us really to know who was actually doing these. We could look on our analytics and see how many had been downloaded. But um, whether people were doing them is a, is a different kettle of fish. Um, we, we sort of put out the call like, oh, well, you know, send us what you've done on social media. But very few people did. So, you know, you've got to balance that as well. So this was the first thing we did. And uh, this kind of led on to the second. So our come and create videos. Um, come and create was our monthly craft activities for families in the museum and was the, the first of our regular in-house provisions to move online. So we got here, this is the first one. This is our clever cats. And um, they included a craft template, which you could download from our website and uh, a how-to video, I've been calling them. Now, you guys don't have this problem, but when we create something, everything has to be in English and in Welsh. And so um, I was very sort of set that I wanted to, to have, I didn't want to speak in it because then I'd have to make two videos, which um, seemed a little messy to me. And, um, you know, two videos would take an awful lot of time. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer here. I'm very lucky as my partner is a professional filmmaker. And so I was very, very lucky that he had all the stuff. Um, but, you know, this was, uh, he, he helped me film the first one, but then told me I was on my own because uh, he has his own job and his own work to do. And so these were made um, on iMovie, which um, is just the free software that came with my laptop. Um, and I will show you one now. So I'm just going to have to stop sharing my screen and share it again. Great. Right, so just bear with Hannah for a second while she gets the YouTube link. We've discovered that the YouTube links don't work from PowerPoints on Zoom for some no. reason. <laughs> um, so this is the second one we made. Um, I will play it now. I'll try and turn my sound up so you can hear it. But this was all free and I think it's also important to point out that um, because my lockdown started quite quickly I did not have time to sort of grab a load of craft stuff so I was sort of stuck with what's in my flat and um, that I think in at the start it was very frustrating because I could all I could think of was the lovely resource cupboard in the museum filled with everything I needed but when we were doing this. Um, we wanted it just to be stuff you have around, you know, no specialist equipment. And so I was sort of in the same boat as the families I was aiming for. So that actually worked out quite well. So I will play this for you now. I 
giving you a little taste. You can find those all on the website if you want to uh, see them in full, but I won't bore you all now. Right, I'll get my PowerPoint up, bear with. Ah, can everyone see that? <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, like I said, those were made on iMovie, which is free. Um, so, you know, I, I was sort of very strict with myself that, you know, it was so tempting a lot of the time to look at all these things that you could buy on the internet, but, you know, you start going down that rabbit hole and your, your bill gets quite um, large. Um, so again, with these, um, we could tell how many people were downloading them from the website, um, but we couldn't tell who, how many people were making them. We also had um, the views on, um, on the platforms. So we put them out on YouTube, on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, we didn't put them out on Instagram because they were slightly too long. And so they'd have to go on Instagram TV, which made it a bit more complicated. Um, we then started working with the university's um, sort of outreach, uh, they're called Reaching Wider. Um, they're, they are the ones who sort of have target schools to um, focus, uh, they focus on and target characteristics and they, we started putting together craft packs. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of those to show you because they've got them all. Um, but these went out um, as sort of, you know, things to do. Um, we also started putting them together for our um, uh, worksheets and we had quite a fun little, um, we called it a mummification experiment where you get um, a tomato and you cover it in salt and you leave that for a week and then have a control tomato and compare them at the end and so you kind of mummify that tomato and so we had um, them sending out tomatoes and different types of salt because you can use you know table salt you can use um, bicarbonate of soda and things like that and that was quite fun because we knew people were using them and um, we knew people were enjoying them we got a lot more feedback from that than we did uh, just putting stuff out there we did put together um, a, a survey monkey feedback for um, all the the learning things but had very few respondents uh, which was a shame but you know I think people had a lot more uh, on their minds than filling in my surveys so this is sort of the last sort of bit we did for families which all sort of led to the school stuff we just finished this yesterday so these were our online family workshops um, each on a different theme uh, we did these every Wednesday throughout August um, and so to give you a little bit of background our holiday workshops were very popular um, before we closed and this was a, um, a way I suppose of not quite continuing them on because these were only um, at max an hour whereas the workshops um, would last all day and I think um, a lot of people use them for childcare you know they drop the, the kids with us and, and then pick them up at the end of the day um, that had its own um, issues I suppose with um, you know who we were reaching because we found we had a lot of other university staff um, so you know are, are we re reaching a very wide audience um, but these these were quite successful. We didn't have, you know, the hundreds of people we dreamed of. Um, but from what I have heard from other colleagues in the sector, um, family learning just hasn't been too, you know, it ha there hasn't been a huge demand for it. Um, and the difference um, between these is we did charge for them. Um, so um, as lockdown went on, um, there was a bit of pressure from, um, the higher ups to start making money again and uh you know that's just the way it is isn't it uh you know we all wish we could give everything away for free but you know <laughs> bills to be paid um and people did pay for them which um was a good sign to us um it was sort of five pound for per family because we couldn't there was no way to police per person um and we got a much wider audience than we would have if we were doing them in person. Um, we have found our audience has been a lot more global since uh, doing this, um, things online. So um, we've also been doing um, sort of talks for adults and we've had people from all over the world. I think, you know, America, Canada, Costa Rica randomly. Um, and we did, we had a couple of Americans and even a couple of Egyptian people came to this, um, which I was quite, quite surprised, you know, pleasantly surprised at. Um, 
and um, we were quite strict with safeguarding so um, unfortunately it had to be the sort of like I am now sort of talking into the void and just um, having the chat box as a communication uh, tool which you know isn't perfect and you especially with young people we found that was very hard to um to uh, carry on that sort of communication back and forth that we would have in the museum and you know we talked about you know maybe we could let them have their mics on but that seemed like um you know having you know 20 odd families with their mics on at once um seemed uh like a recipe for disaster to be honest and i don't think there is a, a sort of perfect solution to this um but the, we, they did change over time so we found that using polls was quite fun so you know asking questions and um and using the zoom poll function to um you know get answers get opinions was also fun um um and we also use the whiteboard tool. I don't know if any of you have used that, but there is a way you can get other people to sort of scribble on your PowerPoint. And so we had uh, word searches uh, that people could do, and it was sort of like a race, um, which um, that sort of, I think, competitiveness added a lot to it rather than just watching someone talk at you for uh, 45 man minutes um, to an hour. Um, and this also gave us a great way of practicing um, facilitating with smaller groups than we would with a school. So, our school stuff. <laughs> um, this is brand new for us from September. And as you can see, it's like a combination of everything we've done over lockdown. So it's going to include activities and work, uh, video content and online facilitation. So you have your pre and post facilitation activities and then obj object exploration with one of our learning facilitators. So it will be me or the learning assistant at the moment. Um, and so just to give you a, the website, I would say if you've got a good handle on your website, to me that was invaluable because that is the platform for most of our things. Um, and these it's a protected page. So teachers pay for it and they um, will get access and the password to this page on the website or one of these pages so we have two workshops running at the moment we've got death in the afterlife um, and life in ancient egypt for key stage two and foundation phase two for key stage three and four we've got um, more gcse specific um, topics such as art in ancient egypt and medicine is a big popular one in wales um, and so you click on those and so the pre-facilitation are videos um, and post-facilitation are um, uh, worksheets and this is an example of one of the pages with the worksheets. So we have tried to make it as sort of clear as possible. Um, so we've got a little um, uh, snapshot of the worksheet and the way to download the activity and also the answers for the teacher. Um, key stages, um, topics, and for one difference I could find with like for this talk um, was Wales's curriculum is a key, uh, key skill curriculum. So we focus on um, skills rather than subjects, and these are the skills that this um, uh, this particular worksheet uh, focuses down on. Um, also, we give a little overview and also some learning objectives. Um, I hope I'm doing all right for time as well. I think you've got a couple more minutes, Hannah. Fantastic. So um, each of our um, activities has a page like this. Um, I, I don't know why, but my brain always works in threes. So we've got three post activities and three uh, pre um, facilitation activities. Um, the facilitation is going to be object exploration. I have well, I'm working on um, getting permission to go into the museum in September. But in case of you know local lockdowns, and Swansea seems to be all right, touch words, um, at this particular time that our cases are staying low and same in, in Cardiff, um, where I am. Um, so we're hoping we'll be able to go into the museum and use the objects in our handling collection. I have had to be quite 
sort of open-minded myself, but also advocating to the rest of the team that there is an inherent value in using digital objects, so photos, um, and sort of having 3D exploration there, and also in using replicas. Um, and, um, you know, everyone has their own opinions on that. Um, I think, you know, especially when you're looking at objects that are thousands of years old, there is um, a massive value in replicas because you can you can touch them and handle them in ways that you just couldn't do um, with the original. Um, and we've always used replicas for our loan boxes as well. Um, so, you know, we know they work, um, but, you know, especially so the curator, the collections manager was sort of like, but it's not real. And it's like, well, unless you give me the objects to take home, I'm kind of stuck there. So you're going to have to get used to that. Um, so um, this, the object exploration, um, we are using sensory engagement, which sounds a little crazy when um, I say it uh, online, but we find there are ways you can sensory engage with an object. Um, before um, without even being able to touch it. So I have a, um, I can't play it too unfortunately because it isn't complete, but my colleague um, has got, is working on um, a wonderful soundscape of an Egyptian tomb. And so, you know, we're going to use this as a bit of a mindful um, moment where kids can close their eyes and just listen to the sounds of, of an ancient Egyptian tomb. Um, I've also sent um, teaches a list of materials so for example if, if the object is made of wood they get something made of wood and you know you can you can feel that and you know you know what the wood feels like how heavy is it and so um we have also been practicing this with our young volunteers um we have a very active pool of um, volunteers ages 10 to 18 and they have been absolute stars as I have, you know, tried this and said, oh, actually, I'm going to change this. Can we try it again? And we have our sort of um, our dress rehearsal tomorrow. So fingers crossed that goes all right. And we, we are getting bookings, which is, um, you know, always the fear, isn't it? Um, you know, you put all this work in and, uh, you know, no one wants it or, you've, you know, it's just not you know you've done it wrong you've misread the room i guess um we we've had bookings from um quite a wide geographical area so we've got um you know our, our regulars um so you know in wales in swansea in cardiff uh, we've also had bookings from england um lots from herefordshire actually randomly and um our furthest away was canada which i thought was quite exciting um yes so I think if I'm looking at lessons I've learned, um, we have to change the way that we measure our engagement. You know, it's not enough these days to, you know, sit in the museum and count the amount of kids that turn up. Um, so, you know, how, how are we going to do that? Um, you know, it, it'll be easier with the squirrels, um, but not so easy with, um, you know the the stuff I'm just sort of putting out there online it's sort of I, I suppose like Tom will talk now like into the void um I would say um keep it simple some of our most successful activities were the simplest um you know and for me this has definitely been an exercise in um I don't need all the sort of specialist equipment that you know we have um you know, I had someone at the start like, why don't you make clay necklaces? And it's sort of like, with, with what clay? Um, so to me, that was very important. Um, and I think now is the time to be creative, you know, play around with new softwares and ideas. No one really knows what they're doing now. I think I would be the first to say at the start, I was just sort of like, oh, um, okay, I'll, I'll do this then, see how that lands. And, you know, there's no sort of rule book for what what we are doing and so now is the time to try things and I think the most important one is be gentle with yourself because you know it's easy to look around at what everyone else is doing and think oh why am I doing all these you know amazing things but you know everyone's in different situations and just be kind to yourself and yeah that's that's all of it from me Brilliant. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was fantastic. And um, we've had loads of really interesting questions. So what I suggest is we can't get to all the questions. What we've been doing with some of these sessions is 
is getting our speakers to answer the questions afterwards and then we can send that out with the PowerPoint. So if we don't have time to go through them all. Um, brilliant. Without further ado, our next case study is Tom Briggs, who's at Bletchley Park, and he is actually going to talk very specifically about teaching into the void and um, how, how to sort of navigate all of that in a remote learning world. So um, without further ado, I will introduce you to Tom. So um, Tom will now um, share his screen. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm going to do things slightly differently. I'm not going to share my screen. Instead, I'm going to ask you, uh, well, I should be full screen if you're on speaker view, but if you want to keep me pinned, if you go to the top right of my, uh, my video window in Zoom, click the three dots and choose pin video, you should keep me um, front and centre. Uh, and you'll, will, uh, you'll see why I'm doing this a little bit later on. It's part of my, part of my talk. Um, uh, well, um, some interesting stuff from Hannah there. I don't think uh, I was prepared to follow the idea of mummifying tomatoes, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, hopefully this will be uh, useful to you. Uh, I've got some uh, contact details here. If you want to get in touch afterwards, I'll put those back up at the end because obviously you won't decide. I'll give you a free tip as well uh, for taking part in online sessions like this. This may be an obvious thing to a lot of people, but things are only obvious once you know them, aren't they? So. Um, if I want to keep something on a slide that somebody's presenting, I'll hit print screen, paste it directly into a document and then uh, go back and crop it later to, to the bit that I want. Feel free to do that with, with any of my stuff here. Um, I am going to be talking to you about avoiding the void or uh, we all talk to ourselves anyway, but is it really the best way to teach? Um, a little background for me, so why am I qualified to be talking about this stuff? What, what am I doing? So I used to be a maths teacher, which, which means that I'm a bit of a nerd. So uh, I like to dabble in this digital stuff. Uh, currently learning manager at Bletchley Park, but probably not for much longer. Uh, if you know anything about Bletchley Park, you may have heard about the restructuring that's going on. And uh, the learning team is being hit very hard by that. So um, I may be joining some of you freelancers soon. Um, so if anybody wants to follow me with the, the details I put up before and will put up again, feel free. It'd be nice to, to grow my, uh, to grow my network in the, the museums and heritage sector, uh, especially if you're interested in developing what you're doing with digital learning or maths in your, uh, in your programs and in your histories and stories. Uh, if you think there's no maths in your histories and stories, then you're the person that I'm talking to and I really want you to get in touch because uh, I can show you how wrong you are. Um, anyway, uh, I recently completed a PG cert in digital leadership. I'm lucky enough to be completing that whilst furloughed. That really helped. Uh, Jem helped me out uh, with that quite a bit and I'm hoping to publish some of the results fairly soon. Uh, uh, and that is uh, relevant to museums and heritage in the digital world. Uh, you can see some of my output from, from that at this uh, bit.ly link here. That link will come up again uh, later at the end. So uh, if you're at all interested more broadly, uh, please do visit that uh, and comment, ask questions, anything like that. I'm awaiting uh, a response to my application for a master's in education as well. So I'm hoping to continue some of that work on uh, and some of this work as well. So, um, First of all, what's the void? Some of you may be wondering what that void is that I'm talking about. Uh, a couple of months ago, I took part in a, another GEM course uh, in conjunction with the Jewish Museum called Virtual Classrooms, How to Bid Build a Digital Approach for September. Now, that was led by Frances Jean. And uh, she, she spoke about something in that that I hadn't really thought about too much explicitly but then I realized hang on I have actually been working to overcome some of these problems I just hadn't had a, a phrase for it and the phrase was teaching to the void and the idea with that is that you when you you start a presentation like this uh, you you hit present it fills your screen and then you're just talking away to to nobody just talking to yourself uh, and there are some problems involved in teaching to the void and and I've sort of narrowed it down to four 
uh, particular problems uh, that occur to me. One is that your own presentation fills the entire screen. So you can't really see what's going on. You can't see the chat. You can't see the faces of the people watching you. Um, you, are, you are literally just waffling at your own presentation. Um, number two, the extra cognitive load of doing this stuff and learning how to do it fills your entire brain. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure some of you are feeling the same as me. Uh, when you're delivering sessions, you've got so much to do. It is like piloting a spaceship and um, uh, it's, it's really, really difficult to, to, to juggle everything whilst also spinning the plates. Um, also deciding what platform to use fills your entire schedule and um, your presentation, once you've, you've solved these other three problems, your presentation still fills their entire screen. So they cannot uh, interact with you uh, as much as you can't interact with them. They can't see you. They, they, they can't uh, take cues from your body language or your facial expressions or anything like that because all they can see is your presentation. So I'm going to, I'm going to, um, attack all four of these problems in order and hopefully get through that by about five past eleven. Uh, I realised from looking at some of the comments that were coming through with Hannah's uh, fantastic uh, talk, uh, you may well have lots of questions that are tangential to what I'm talking about and, and I would really like to uh, continue this discussion offline. I'm more than happy to have chats with people um, if what I say today and what comes out in the Q&As later uh, doesn't quite answer it for you. So again, my details will be up at the end and feel absolutely free to get in touch. Um, so the case study I want to talk about is actually uh, uh, not something that I, I did at Bletchley Park. So uh, I'm calling this uh, case study Space Maths with Potential Plus. Um, Potential Plus, there's their website there, potentialplusuk.org. They're uh, an, an organization that provides support and activities for young people with high learning potential. Uh, they have, un well, for the, for the next short time as well, they have been based in Bletchley, uh, next door to us, and we've worked with them quite a lot over the, over the years. Uh, and I've done something with them almost every year since I started at Bletchley Park eight years ago, uh, including in the last few years. They, they come here uh, and we have a, an on-site session uh, that we, we've developed specifically for them, and it's always great fun. Uh, this year, however, lockdown happened and our planned event uh, didn't happen. So uh, I, I uh, was contacted by uh, my, my friends at Potential Plus who asked me if I could do a series of code breaking sessions for their V Plus series. I'll leave you to look up what V Plus is. It's essentially their response to not being able to do things in the real world and taking it online. Um, but I was furloughed. Um, my employer didn't want to unfurlow me in order to deliver these sessions. So I suggested that I did something slightly different with them instead. So rather than doing code breaking, which might have put me in a bit of um, a sticky situation with regards to the furlough rules, I did one of my other interests, which is astronomy uh, and did some space maths sessions. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what the sessions actually uh, involved, but it was kind of based around um, some stuff that I wrote here. If you're at all interested, this is completely tangential, nothing to do with the session that we're looking at today. But if you're interested in the kind of topic that I might have covered, uh, there's a link there that will be on the last page as well. Um, so overcoming problem one. Problem one was your own presentation fills your entire screen. So uh, a little known fact that I'd like to share with you now is that presentations do not have to fill your entire screen. Uh, this is something that doesn't involve any special software or particular special skills, but it's something that I felt a little bit silly when I realized that it was possible to present in a window rather than filling the whole screen. And then I realized, hang on, if I don't know this, maybe some other people don't as well. So maybe I can, I can share that with you. Um, so you can see here, this is, um, this is a screenshot of a, uh, my typical screen when I'm presenting. This looks very much like my screen does now I'm, while I'm talking to you at the moment. Uh, you can see that over here is a presentation uh, you can also see that this presentation is in presentation mode and it is not filling the screen. There are other things around here, notes and stuff that I need to take, uh, uh, I need to take note of while I'm, while I'm talking. So how did I achieve this? It's really, really easy to do. 
Um, uh, I'm using Google Slides. Uh, um, I know not a lot of people do that. I'll get onto PowerPoint in a minute, but with Google Slides, it's really, really easy uh, to do this. You just have to open your Google Slides presentation, put it into pre presentation mode, so as if you're going to present it, and then you click a button, and then you resize the window. The button that you click, if you are uh, in presentation mode in Google Slides and you move the mouse around, this bar comes up here. It's a bit like when you're moving your mouse around over the Zoom window, there's a bar that appears at the bottom with things you can do. The same is true in Google Slides. The thing you have to click is this button here. Uh, this stops the presentation being full screen and puts it in its own window, and you can resize it and put it where you want. So that's what I'm doing now to talk to you. I've got my, uh, my presentation on the left-hand side of my screen, and I've got the Zoom chat window open on the right hand side of the screen so i can see that joanne sutherland uh said that something made her chuckle um shortly after i started my presentation ah brilliant thank you very much i'm assuming you're talking about something i said and not something in the room with you um but i i can see what's going on in the chat yet uh, chat there which is something you can't do if your screen is filled with presentation um now powerpoint it's slightly more complicated but not a lot really once you know what you're doing um, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, Joe Gillam has just asked, do your presentation suggestions only work in Zoom? And I will cover that um, in a couple of minutes. PowerPoint, uh, yes, the, the process is here. This is, this is a PowerPoint, so it's a little bit small probably on your screens, but uh, you'll get the idea. Uh, the first step is to go to the slideshow menu on the ribbon here, click that. The second thing is to go to set up slideshow, which is here. Uh, click that and this window opens. And within that window, uh, underneath the show type section, there are three options. You've got a full screen one, a one that says window, and one that says kiosk full screen. Uh, you wanna go for the middle one of those. So the one called browsed by an individual brackets window. Uh, so choose that radio button and then just pr press OK. That'll close. Then present um, present your PowerPoint as is normal from beginning, from current slide or whatever. Uh, and then it will be in its own window rather than filling the screen. So you can you can resize <clears throat> uh, and uh, have other things on your screen like notes, uh, which I find is quite helpful. Um, so uh, that's problem one. If you've got any questions about that, please do put them in the chat. Devon will make a note of them and then uh, we can talk about some of them later on if we get time. Again, uh, contact me if you want to uh, talk about this further later. Problem two, extra cognitive load fills your entire brain. Uh, a colleague of mine, new colleague of mine, put it succinctly with, it's like learning to teach all over again. Um, I just want to reassure you that, that, like everything else, the more you do it, it, the more it will become second nature. But uh, really good practice is to co-present. Um, I want to uh, just put this into, into the context of being a bit like a sp piloting a spaceship. Um, spaceship's quite complicated. You wouldn't necessarily pilot one by yourself. There's lots of things to do. So uh, get someone else to help you. Um, lots of things to do dish out these, uh, these tasks, anything that needs to be done. Um, just sort of slipping into a, a thing that we've done at Bletchley Park, we've done some trial sessions and we have been co-presenting. Different models include uh, someone doing the presenting, someone else monitoring the chat, a bit like we're doing here, Devon and, uh, and others monitoring the chat, taking out questions um and uh people doing the techie side another way that we did it is that uh we we sort of team taught where one of us delivered part of the session and the other one did the other behind the scenes stuff monitoring of chat and things like that and then we did another activity and swapped over so the people we're talking to are getting different faces um problem three was deciding what platform to use fills your entire schedule so um uh, here's another little known fact. Uh, it doesn't matter much. Um, there's been, we had lots of conversation at Bletchley Park before, before lockdown happened. What did we use? Do we use Teams? Do we use Zoom? Do we use Google Meet? Do we use any one of a million different possibilities out there? And really, it doesn't matter. Most of these things have pretty much the same uh, 
uh, functionality and um, uh, it, it, yeah, it really doesn't matter. Um, in the example of Potential Plus, the, uh, the space maths thing I did, I used Zoom and I actually, I, I got a login for the Potential Plus accounts. They gave me a login so I could uh, allow the students in. They connected from their individual homes. Uh, with the BP trials we've done, uh, we did one via Zoom where all the individual students were at home, but they connected to their class Zoom account or their school Zoom account that their teacher was hosting. And then we presented it as a guest on there. The experience for me as a presenter was very much the same, except the teacher was um, meeting people and um, monitoring the chat and, and dealing with other things like that, uh, whereas I didn't have to. I, I, broke for the potential plus thing i broke um the problem two solution because i didn't have anyone else to co-present with so i was presenting on my own for that um but with bp trials we had other other people available uh we've also uh presented things in teams so students have been in bubbles of two to three classrooms and we've been projected onto their interactive whiteboards uh, and we've hosted that on our organizational teams account so um very much uh from our point of view the process is pretty much the same uh regardless of which which system you're using they do look a little bit different you do have to have a bit of a fiddle just to make sure you know how to do screen sharing and how to mute people and what's a what you're able to do but there are there are lots of really important reasons why you might want to just be uh a a uh, an all-rounder with this and one of those is that uh, when I did, I started doing some research into digital learning over the last few years, uh, I, I've seen other people doing it. And one of the things I noted was they had their system that they paid for. Maybe it was Blackboard or something like that. They invite school groups to join in uh, and log in. And then they spend the first quarter to third, maybe even half a lesson in some cases, teaching them how to react in, this, in the system that they're using. Um, if you use their system, if you guest in their system and present in the system that they're used to, you don't have to teach them how to use it. They already know. Also, if you are um, guesting on your schools, on a school's system, uh, then to a large extent, there are lots of safeguarding issues that are completely solved because the school has already taken care of them. Safeguarding is massively important, um, uh, even online and in some cases, especially online. And um, uh, we all have safeguarding procedures, but the schools are almost necessarily more robust. Plus, if the, the children have their own individual logins, that's that little bit more secure. When they're joining in with our systems, they necessarily have to have an open link. And technically, if, if something goes wrong, absolutely anybody could join in with that and could uh, present anything momentarily on your system. So safeguarding is a little bit easier um, if you are presenting in their system rather than if they're presenting it in yours. Uh, so that's problem three. Uh, last one, uh, problem four. I try and get through this fairly quickly, but it is one of the most complicated ones. Um, that last problem was your presentation still fills their entire screen and they can't see you. Um, so uh, a little known fact for you is that it doesn't have to fill their entire screen. Um, and if you want some evidence of that, well, uh, there it is. I am here. I am, you can see me and you can see my presentation at the same time. I haven't got a massive board behind me with my presentation on. Uh, this is all done digitally. So, um, uh, yes, that doesn't have to. Um, I have used a, a piece of software called OBS Studio. This is uh, a, um, an open source piece of software, which means it's free and it's made by enthusiasts. And um, strangely, uh, that meant that it was really hard to get my employer to agree to install it because um, they wanted me to use something that had to be paid for rather than something that was free because the argument was that the, the support can disappear with OBS Studio and then you're left in the lurch uh, with, with um, open source software, then you're left in the lurch. Um, OBS Studio has a massive um, 
a massive following. There's a lot of people working on this open source stuff. I don't think that's a danger with this. Uh, but the key thing really is I couldn't find anything else that would do the same thing. What OBS Studio does is it allows you to construct a virtual webcam. So uh, you can put together a, uh, a screen where it collects your presentation from one uh, window and it can use your webcam feed and you can arrange those how you like on your screen and then you tell OBS Studio to turn that screen that you've arranged into, a, into something that your computer thinks is another webcam. So this is like a fake webcam. So I'm not actually presenting here with my webcam plugged directly into Zoom, as it were. I've got my webcam feeding into OBS Studio, which has also got other things feeding into it. Then the software is packaging that up and then telling my computer that it is, um, that it is a webcam. Uh, uh, Claire, can you see the other people when you are presenting this way? Um, uh, I can, I can choose. I've kind of got my my own screen uh, pinned at the moment, which is um, not because I'm particularly vain, just I like to see what you're seeing so that I know I'm making sense and it's all working. But I've clicked a button now and I can see people's cameras. Yeah, so I can see people reacting. I can see people scratching their noses. I can see you if you yawn. Um, so uh, uh, yes, you, you can see other people. Um, if you do this so that helps again to overcome that disconnect a lot of what we do as educators in front of people feeds back on the reactions that you're getting from from the group if you you have a presentation in the way of seeing them and they have a presentation in the way of seeing you you have got rid of an enormous amount of uh, of that um that that connection that that human link which lets us know that we're doing something right or doing something wrong and we need to adjust things now this is not a this is not a perfect solution um this is this is not really eye contact restored it's pseudo eye contact you're not going to get genuine eye contact through these situations but you can start to see people's reactions and you can start to get feedback from their body language and things like that if you if you use a system like this um using this with zoom specifically requires an extra plugin something to do with the the way zoom works uh, i've put the, a link in for that as well remember these links will be up on the final page and I'm happy to share these afterwards. Uh, does this still work if you're guessing on a school platform? Yes, yes, this is uh, basically if you can present a webcam, uh, the OBS Studio thing does pretend to be your webcam. So uh, you can use that webcam feed wherever a webcam feed uh, will work, um, assuming uh, all the plugins are in place. Uh, there's one thing that I, uh, I got a little bit stuck with, um, all the difficult bits uh, I managed to get done. And then the really simple bits, uh, it took me ages to work out that needed to be done. Uh, there's a, there's a button that you have to enable in virtual cam whenever you want to use it for a broadcast. So just, just keep, um, an eye open for that. I realize I haven't told you how to do this. I haven't taken you on a tutorial here and it might seem very daunting. It does take a bit of practice, but it is doable. It is possible. And it is fairly easy when you know how, just like so many things. Um, it can be fiddly, but it is very powerful. I'm sure a lot of you will become, come up with some weird and wonderful ways of using this that haven't even occurred to me. Uh, the, the most important thing with this stuff is to have a play around um, don't be too scared to, uh, to try things out and to experiment. Try things out with your colleagues and your friends, but it's really important that we, we get a hold of this stuff because there's some amazing opportunities uh, to be had with this technology. So the bottom line then uh, for my section, I'll finish very soon. Um, online teaching is different to offline teaching and it should be treated as such. We should be embracing that difference. We, we can't uh, just expect to take what we've done offline and turn it into something online. Uh, skills from offline teaching are still relevant though, and we've just got to make sure that we, we have a way of allowing those to, to inform what we're doing. Um, it feels difficult at first, but uh, we all know that, that that thing where it feels difficult at first is called learning. You know you're learning if, you, if you're struggling a little bit at first, uh, but you'll get there in the end. 
Uh, there are so many possibilities with all of this stuff and uh, uh, just play around, talk to people, um, talk to each other and, and learn from each other. Uh, digital or online learning sessions, this is a key one for me and I'm seeing it around the sector. Uh, there's, there's an assumption from a lot of cases that this is a temporary fix for the current situation. Uh, it's not, this is here to stay. So you have an opportunity to lead the way on this. You can be at the front of development. If you can do the basics, if you can present a PowerPoint to a group of people in Zoom, you are at the front of what's happening at the moment. Anything you can do beyond that takes you to the front of the curve. You are leading, you are leading, you are trend setting. So be, take, take heart from that. Uh, whatever, however little you can do at the moment, uh, you're, you're, on, you're on track. It's great. Right, uh, last, last page there again. If you want to take a screenshot of this, feel free. Uh, I've put the, the URLs that I featured in there in the, in the chat here. Uh, I don't think I've missed any off. A little bit of further reading down here. So uh, there's a, an expansion on the, the bit about how to deliver presentations in their own window that I wrote on my own blog. And here's a, the gem post that uh, this talk is based on, uh, that is on, on the gem website there's a link to that there and uh, here's my personal information please do get in touch because I am going to need some freelance work soon um, <laughs> uh, thank you very much do thank post you, your questions. brilliant sorry thank you very much Tom that was fantastic um, really really interesting and great to sort of delve in in detail into you know the technicalities of, of teaching into the void so thank you um, Sorry to interrupt you, by the way. Um, so we're going to have a very quick break now. We're slightly, a little bit behind, um, about five minutes behind. So should, can everyone have a five minute comfort break? Be back at, quarter, well, four minute comfort break. Be back at quarter past 11. Is that all right, everybody? Grab a tea. If you want to, put, you can stop your camera while you go and have your, get your tea and what have you. And um, we'll be back at quarter past. Those of you who are on, can I check that I have successfully shared my screen ready for the next bit? Yes, Miranda. Yep, I can see it. Fab, thank you very much. I've forgotten how we unpin you, Tom. Can you <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but you don't want me there. Um, yeah, if you just, um, I think if you go to the same place, if you go to uh, the three dots in the top right corner of my window and then choose unpin uh i think that should do it oh that's funny because it says it was unpinned yeah yeah so have we got that Hi everyone. Um, I've got a uh, a yellow page, but I've still got Tom pinned, and it's not letting me unpin you, Tom. I don't know if you know how to what to do um, about that. I've unpinned you. And it's still you still seem to be pinned. But um, I think maybe if you go into the different view, like yeah, there's a box at the top which has got a kind of oh I don't know how to do <laughs> where with a little corner popping out yeah. that box seems to go back to the presentation has everybody got that yeah i've still got tom but that's all right <laughs> thank you okay swap it's a box that says swap shared screen i think with video hmm. have you am i is my presentation filling your screen and I've, I've got you in the top left hand, um, right hand corner in a little box. 
and then the main screen is the yellow the yellow is screen. it because i'm not actually talking at the moment and that it needs me to talk to know yeah. that i'm the person speaking um you're still not there it, no, that, it hasn't like, it hasn't <laughs> it itself just because no, i've started no, i think that I've still got Tom in my speaker view. That's interesting. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I also have Tom in my speaker view. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Oh, now I don't. He's gone now. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah, you're, Sarah, you're now, now there instead. Oh, no. I don't want to know anyone that's speaking, I think. Miranda, yeah, go chat. To Hello, me. I'm, do you want to come and, yes, look at me now. Can you hear me? Yes, brilliant. I can see. Thank Aww. you. <laughs> Good day. Right, right. Well, we're waiting for everyone to return. Thanks, Tom, for sorting that out. It's all a learning curve. Devon, how many questions do we have all together? We've got a lot. Um, oh, I'm trying to condense what? them. And what we've done <laughs> before is... Um, if the questions aren't answered during the Q&A, we'll just get in touch with the speakers and ask them if they could just provide a brief answer and then we could send that up in the follow-up material. If that'd be all yeah, right. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, right, what time is it now? Actually, it's... it's Ready. Pass. Is everybody back? Well, I think we'll make a start. Okay, well, um, our third and final case study um, is Miranda Stern, um, Head of Learning at the Fitzwilliam Museum. So I'm going to, without further ado, pass over to Miranda, who's going to talk to us about reopening through recovery. So we're sort of moving away from remote learning to think about um, you know, how, how is um, COVID sort of impacting more broadly on learning services and how is the University of Cambridge Museums approaching that? So thank you, Miranda. Thank you and good morning, everybody. And um, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you to the last two speakers. And yeah, Tom, I'm really sad. I have not seen your presentation and internalized it before I prepared this. So I am giving my presentation into the void and I can't see what's going on in the chat. Many apologies, everybody, but I look forward to hearing your questions later. Um, so as Rachel said, I'm gonna, I'm, my case study is sort of the, that is sort of how we deal with that moment where we, we start to have the option of not teaching into the void and how we um, begin to plan for what learning looks like post reopening. Um, so I'm speaking from the Fitzwilliam Museum. Um, oh, you see, it's not like me. Oh, there we go. It is. Um, I'm speaking, well, clearly I'm actually speaking from a living room, but <laughs> I'm head of learning at the Fitzwilliam Museum, which is the Museum of Art and Antiquities that's part of the University of Cambridge, just to give you a bit of context. We are quite a large regional museum, so we welcome um, in a normal year around 400,000 visitors, about 14,000 school visits. Um, but we are part of a consortium, the University of Cambridge Museums Consortium, which consists of the eight museum collections and the Botanic Garden that are part of the university. And you can see here we we cover a whole range of disciplines, so archaeology and anthropology through to zoology via exploration, dinosaurs, etc. Um, but also, I think importantly for this conversation, we are also all different sizes and scales. So um, the museum I'm part of is the largest. Um, we are in our own building. We're sort of in control of our own destiny. Some of the other museums in the consortium are much smaller, they are embedded in university department buildings, um, they find themselves in a very different situation. And I guess I'm flagging this up because my main message to you is that there's no kind of one size fits all approach to this, that we're all going to be doing this in different ways at different paces. And we've had to kind of make our peace with that, you know, within our consortium. Um, so maybe echoing a little bit um, what one of the other speakers said about kind of not beating ourselves up about the fact if we seem to be doing things at slightly different paces or in different ways. 
and for me it's been really helpful to kind of bounce ideas around the consortium and 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 support each other in this decision making and in a way all i'm sharing with you now is the process that we are still going through around that so I'm not sitting here from a point of view of being able to tell you how to do it. Clearly, we have not welcomed um, any schools back yet. Um, I don't know whether, I think we had one colleague here from the Highlands. I don't know whether any other Scottish colleagues are at the point where you've already had to test that stuff. But I'm just sharing with you the kind of the process we went through, because I think it's always helpful to think these things through together. So our mission is to activate the power of the university through our collections, sharing with our communities and networks to deepen understanding of our world, inspire new thinking and address local and global challenges. And when we kind of confirmed this refreshed mission statement back about nine months ago, I don't think any of us had any inkling the scale of the local and global challenges that we were going to be talking about. Um, but clearly what I want to talk about today is how we are beginning to plan to kind of keep that sharing with our communities right at front and center as we go into the reopening conversations. Um, so just to kind of give you a snapshot as what, of what has happened so far for us, and some of this I think will feel very familiar to lots of you and then there'll be points of difference. So I'm sure like most of you, all our sites closed very quickly in March, we were yeah, literally grabbing art materials, tripods, whatever we thought might be helpful to continue delivery from home, kind of as we went out the door. Um, unlike um, many other sites, we were very fortunate that the majority of our learning staff were not furloughed. And I do realize that's a very privileged position that we've been in. And that's meant two things. One has, one has been around the remote learning offers that we've been able to develop. So right from the outset, we began working on remote learning and have been doing that throughout the period in different ways, both digitally and not digitally. Um, and that's also, that's been important in and of itself in terms of continuing to serve our various communities, including schools but also because it's kept us in live dialogue with them. And that in turn has helped inform the conversations we've been having about what happens next. Um, it's also meant, I think, really helpfully. And I guess this is, again, why I'm keen to share our experiences with those who haven't necessarily been in the same position, that because we've all been here, we've been that conversations about learning and, re and, and the options for kind of what learning looks like post reopening have been live all the way through this process. We've been part of those discussions um, throughout. Um, and we've been sort of feeding our knowledge and understanding as educators that is coming from the conversations we have been able to have with teachers and partners into the bigger conversation about what reopening the museums might look like. Um, I think, you know, we've been very mindful of the, um, of just how, essentially how sort of, how on the one hand, we want to sense check all our thinking with teachers and with other community um, leaders as we plan for reopening, but on the other hand, just incredibly mindful of how frazzed teachers understandably were as we got towards the end of the summer term and so sort of using their time um, that they were able to give us well. Um, so basically back in May, June, at the point when we would have been opening up bookings for autumn term school bookings was the point at which we began to talk amongst ourselves as educators and also with our directors about what the options were for post reopening. And then I guess the final four bullet points on this slide is sort of where I'm at now, which is where we are doing the kind of detail, having thought about the, the overarching principles <laughs> and protocols we're doing the kind of detailed risk assessment kind of activity by activity to think about what can restart when and how and what it will look like. Um, we're at the point where reopening has begun. So we, um, the Fitzwilliam Museum opened at the start of August, as did a couple of our, uh, as did Kettle's Yard. The Botanic Gardens opened earlier as a green outdoor space and it's been really helpful for us to learn from them. The other of our museum sites won't reopen until September, October, and we've had to take all of this into account as we plan and as we communicate. 
and and clearly what we're working towards is again and now i'm i'm not sure thinking back to your terminology at the start Devon. i don't know if i'm using the word blended exactly right here but what i mean is we're clearly we're not going to stop doing the remote work and swing all our attentions and energies and capacity to reopening and being back in person because we know there's a lot of schools a lot of individuals a lot of community groups where coming back on site in person isn't going to be the right thing yet so we need to keep that going and build on it and make it better and make it something that is lasting for the future as well as finding the headspace and the energy to begin doing working out how to reopen so that's where we are at um, and i should say this um, this image is one that our shop came up with and they have now been selling um, adapted greetings cards it's been our big commercial success of lockdown um, to put face masks on various of our portraits is that, um, is that a Manet, that painting? <laughs> that, it, it's actually a Millet, um, as in the, you know, the, um, am I saying that, you know, pre-Raphaelite, English yeah. pre-Raphaelite, um, and it's the twins. Um, so, um, I won't respect, talk about this because the previous speakers have really covered this off, but just say, of course, our immediate response was thinking about what we could provide in that moment in lockdown from our respective homes, um, to be useful to families, um, learning together at home, to be useful to teachers, setting, um, setting work. Um, but we, and we try to think across the age groups. So as well as um, various activities, and I've just listed a few there, we also thought about the fact, for example, that we had to cancel all the work experience kids who would have been spending a week with us in June, July, and what could we offer them alternatively online? But also we're in those conversations with those schools already about basically offering double work experience next year because they're keen that the year 10s whose work experience got cancelled are able to have that experience at the end of year 11. Um, and we also made sure there was a non-digital remote learning offer as well. And I can share links that tell you more about all of these things. But I think one of the helpful things about all this, as I said, was it also kept our conversations with schools and teachers and community partners live and that was helpful as we think about reopening so um this is so i'm just basically sharing with you the, how our thought processes around planning for reopening and this is the kind of six things that we talked our way through so that there was a shared understanding with the directors across the different museums and with our colleagues so we talked about what our in this like rapidly shifting sands the government guidance is changing schools don't know what they're doing we don't know what schools doing no one knows what the r rate is actually setting out okay what are the things we're assuming then what are the assumptions that all our planning is based on let's state those let's say what the unknowns are and almost sort of park them but say that's we just have to cope with those being unknowns what are the principles that are going to govern the decision making as we go forward and make choices. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And then what are the options? So um, none of this is rocket science clearly, but that's how we structured our thinking. And I'm just gonna whiz you through some of the bits of that. So um, sincere apologies for this very boring slide. It's there so that you can come back to it, not so that you can be thrilled by looking at it and reading it now. So these were the assumptions that we kind of presented to our leadership. So. We're assuming that enabling pupils to learn through our collections remains a key priority. It's not a thing we're just gonna kind of put on hold and come back to once, you know, once things are back to normal, that we want to do stuff now. We're assuming that from September, most children will be back learning at school um, rather than um, home learning, subject to avoiding a second wave, but that actually we need a school provision that can kind of move between the two. But, but what that, all that, what that assumption means is that the things we were making for use during deep lockdown, where we were assuming it was, it was children working individually at home with family members, aren't necessarily going to be the right thing if instead we're imagining a teacher leading an interaction for a class. Um, we are making assumptions about social distancing remaining in place, though again, like the exact distancing that different schools or different groups might be trying to adopt is, you know, still feels a bit hazy. We're assuming that visits out of school will be subject to even more stringent risk assessment. And then as a knock on from that, that many schools and teachers and parents will not want to arrange um, 
in-person visits, so demand will be low. And I would say that I, I, it'd be interesting to hear from others, but I would say that assumption has been borne out. It's not non-existent, and so we needed good, straightforward answers for those who wanted to book, but it is low. Um, that said, you know, I ended up having a conversation with the head teacher of one of our strategic partner schools who was very keen to bring the entire of year seven, which I think is about eight classes, or, you know, within the first week of September, which we are not doing, we are, we are booking them in February. Um, so there's really different attitudes among teachers, I think. We're assuming teachers will want to enrich in classroom learning in other ways, and but that that what they're doing in the classroom might be different. So pupil well-being, readjusting school life and catching up will be high priorities. We know some pupils learning will have been more negatively impacted than others. Um, and again, for me, that holding that knowledge might um, impact how we prioritise what we do next and which, which bits of activities we, we, we start. Um, and as I said before, we know teachers have had to show significant flexibility and resilience and might not have a lot of extra capacity for anything that feels additional like focus groups. Um, that said, I've, I'll talk a little bit more later about the fact that actually we've been really pleasantly surprised by the level of teacher engagement. So we also set out what the unknowns are and I won't read through those all for you, but um, you know, there, there are significant unknowns which basically boil down to different schools will take different approaches and um, some of you may be parents or carers. I think, you know, we know much more now than we did back in June, July, when we were trying to make these decisions. But at the same time, it feels like there's still um, a bit of lack of clarity about, you know, how will the school day look? Will it be shorter or, long, or longer? Or, you know, will all children be back full time? What, you know, how will the curriculum be different? So, and we can keep trying to know more about these things through dialogue with schools, but we're never going to kind of know completely. So then we really, we thought it was important to set out what principles would govern the decisions we were making because we sort of, you know, like there, there's, I feel like there's more decision making now and it feels really important, you know, almost life or death decision making in a way saying yes or no to how risky an activity is. We're making more decisions more quickly than we have done for a long time. So what principles were going to govern that? So really crucially for us, the staff and participants must be safe and also feel safe in the museum or online and have an enjoyable experience that builds connection. So again, if you cast your minds back to um, some of those scary pictures that were circulating back in sort of May, June about what school classrooms would look like and, you know, children sort of taped into yellow and black hazard taped boxes and, you know, we felt we didn't want to kind of welcome schools back at all costs if the experience we gave them was one that would kind of put them off museums for life basically. Um, we mustn't compromise on inclusion or quality again that come that's I'll talk a little bit more about that later but basically you know we we don't want to just get anybody in at all costs if that means we're excluding lots of other people. Um, so we we could anticipate where our museum is that the schools that would most want to come back in person most quickly would be the um, private prep schools who are across the road and wouldn't have to worry about transport issues and have small group sizes and all of that. And we had to take a decision about whether we'd sort of bend over backwards to make it safe for those small number of more privileged children to come and learn at the museum or whether we would use our energies in a different way to try it for kind of wider benefit. Um, we want to draw on existing reports and data as much as we can and it's great to see you know already it's been flagged up today both the bridge report the uh, survey report and the um, the space for learning COVID secure guidance are, are new bits of information that we can add into that mix and then the final bit there around just not you know we, we didn't want to lose the things that we think are at the heart of the museum learning that we deliver. Um, and, and that's tricky, but we wanted to make sure we were trying to maintain those. Lots of challenges, obviously. Um, and again, I won't go through those in huge detail, but some of them are technical around, you know, variety of in technical capacity in terms of skills and equipment. Um, as I said, that kind of balancing being responsive to making the most of resource, 
um, and then at the end that that more you know existential challenge around understanding and articulating the role and value of museum learning when the things we usually consider are absent whether that's because we're engaging digitally or because you know we're in the museum but we can't dress up we can't handle objects we can't interact in the same ways that that we might have done in the past um but also spotting the opportunities and um, the opportunities afforded by developing a really strong remote offer so the graph i've got here um shows you that you know so we serve cambridgeshire and beyond but actually when you look at our stats over the past four years, 93% of the primary schools that are in the city of Cambridge have visited, but only 41% of the primary schools that are in Fenland, which is rural um, Cambridgeshire areas of multiple deprivation. If we can make a virtual offer that serves the need of that community going into the future, that's a brilliant outcome from this. But also the opportunity to refresh the school's content um, for when we do welcome people back on site. Um, so actually making the most of this hiatus to work with our curators, to work with teachers, to really craft that. So we basically came up of, with a sort of matrix of five different ways of engaging. So digital self-led, outside of the museum, you know, so teachers using content that we created, um, digital facilitated, so live interaction, loans boxes and activity boxes, in school outreach so us going to them and in real life visits and each of our eight museums basically plotted against that and said right this is what we think we can safely do um, and each museum and collection basically will take a slightly different approach combining these elements based on site capacity existing partnerships and demand um, and again that's my sort of take home to you which is do what is kind of right for your setting at this time um, so for us at the FITS, we are restarting real life visits for targeted partnership projects and programmes, which may include some schools, but actually tends to be more adult community groups. We're restarting some on site family learning in a limited way. Um, but we have suspended our general school bookings for autumn. And instead, what we're saying is if you would have wanted to bring your school this autumn, become part of our teacher panel, be part of the conversation. We will share with you the new content as we develop it. You will potentially be the first people back on site, but get on board and work with us rather than coming in and having our slightly more cobbled together offer. And we're also launching sort of CPD that we hope will start as virtual at the start of the year. And by the time we get to the end of the year, it can be in real life. Um, so this is my final slide in terms of questions to ask yourselves as you go through this what can we do well and safely and if we can't do things well and safely let's not feel pressured to do them um what if we can't do back to normal what's the alternative invitation we're making so as i said that thing around inviting teachers into a, a into a dialogue around creating something with us instead of just saying you can't come back yet Whose expectations need managing? I think that relates to our own staff, to our leadership, to our governance, but also, of course, to our audiences. What can people do or not do when they come back? How can we take the opportunity for long term transformation and who can we involve to make that, even, that transformation even better? Um, so that actually the schools offer we're putting out both in person and digitally after this is better, fresher, newer, more consultative. Than it was previously and um, how do we look after staff well-being and motivation actually especially if we're saying to them we know what you've been looking forward to is in-person engagement getting out of the void but we need you to work in this blended way for a little bit longer um, so that's shaped how i think you, i know we'll all have different concerns and i'm also feel i should say i recognize that i'm fortunate that we didn't rely on school visits for income so the pressures are slightly less for us from that point of view um, but each museum will will come to a different set of answers to these questions and that's okay as, as long as we kind of keep sharing our thinking with each other um, so that's it from me do get in touch if you um, have further questions brilliant thank you very much Miranda that was really really helpful and very clear and really good to have an example of um, 
what a, a larger museum circus is going through in terms of preparing kind of for reopening and school visits. Then let's crack on. Um, I think rather than doing, unless anybody, any of the chairs of the Bakeout groups have got anything major they want to say, I think I just wanted to say, sounds encouraging that schools are actually booking and returning. So I think, you know, it just shows that it is a very mixed picture. So while people, are, some people are saying that they won't be visiting till next year, obviously some schools are definitely visiting. And it's just a reminder really, just to keep absolutely networked with all your local schools and um, try and get those virtual teachers evenings going and all, all of that so that you can um, keep in touch and encourage them back, particularly if they can walk to you or they've got transport. I think one of the issues may well be transport, but if they can walk to you or they've got access to transport, then um, I think you've got a good opportunity, hopefully, to get your schools back in. Um, can I just ask Tom, Devon, Hannah, Miranda, anything from your group so you want to just quickly mention? Ours was a very similar similar thing, Rachel, but just, just saying that now that everything's very digital, the playing field is um, a bit different. The landscape's a bit different because, you know, rather than maybe go to your local museum for resources, you could also go to the British Museum for resources. Um, so just taking that into consideration. So what you were saying about keeping relationships with schools is really, really important. Brilliant. And um, does anybody else? I can't see. We, um... yeah. I think one of the main themes uh, of our chat was basically have a play, be open, try things out, be prepared to get things wrong. Uh, that's how we learn things. And that's that's the business we're in, isn't it? So. I think for our group, yeah, people were just also really appreciating the opportunity to kind of share ideas and sense check with each other and, and sort of, yeah, appreciating that space that Jen was providing and, and then, yeah, sharing some of the exciting things that they're they're thinking around virtual field trips and, and such like. So no, it's a good conversation. Great. Hannah, do we still have Hannah? Yeah, I'm here. Um, so we had a little talk about um, how it's still important to have that sort of hands-on approach. And we talked a bit about loan boxes because um, we don't want to have spent the last, you know, so many years saying, oh, actually, please do touch. And then having go backwards and say, no, no touching. And so we talked about, um, using replicas um, and uh, a lot of people are developing what sounds like really great loan boxes to go out for schools um, that are COVID secure and it's just that um, sort of advocating I suppose throughout the rest of the museum that you know this is still as valuable as the real objects. Brilliant thank you and I think that's also a reminder about you know do what's right for your own context we know that Leeds museums and galleries because of the nature of their vast collection have enough objects to put real objects in their loan boxes, but not everybody's in that situation. So I think, you know, do do what's right for your context and, um, and you know, it's still gonna provide a learning opportunity even with a replica, absolutely. And we were just talking, at, somebody was picking up earlier um, on, um, I think maybe it's something you'd have said, Hannah, but, you know, having like those materials at, in the classroom, you know, even so, even if you can't see the object, you know, having something wooden or something porcelain or what have you, so you get at least the pupils can kind of get a sense of what those materials are like um, for those objects. I think that's a really good tip as well. Um, brilliant. Right. Is everybody happy just to stay for a few more minutes? Um, Devin's going to try and succinctly draw down <laughs> all those vast questions into a couple of key ones. And then I think what we'll try and do is maybe get some of the answers written up and we can add that to the information that we disseminate. Um, I think, um, you know, that will all be sent to you as a part of a delegate pack. So don't worry, you'll have all the PowerPoints and everything sent to you as part of the de delegate pack. That's what Sarah has said. So De Devon, question, yes. question time. Yes. Well, what I've decided to do, and I hope this is all right, is just pick one uh, one good question, one meaty question for each presenter, and then we'll ask you if you wouldn't mind just briefly answering some of them and we'll send them around afterwards. So my first question is for Hannah, um, which is about um, with all of your, in, your, your videos, your materials that you put out, how are you measuring digital engagement? So that is something we had to look at um, because uh, our usual methods of engagement did not work, um, you know, the counting the people who arrived. Um, 
so for the schools it's a lot easier because we i can i can look at how many school bookings we have and i can you know look at how many children are going to be in each um and that's that for the things that i'm just sort of putting out there it's a lot trickier and um so we're, we, uh, we got good analytics from the website, um, use Google Analytics, and um, I can't do it, but the IT um, people uh, can let me know who, how many downloads they've had of each. Um, they also can let me know where in the world that has downloaded from and um, whether it was in English and Welsh is quite useful to us as well. Um, I can't re I can't I can't say for certain that because they've downloaded it they did it which is the tricky bit. Um, so I think it's just important to communicate that like this is these are the best analytics I can give you at this point in time. Um, but you know be aware of these issues um, with the videos we can look at the views. Um, and then people might, if it's on, on YouTube or Facebook, or, you know, they might like them or um, comment and we can we count those engagements as well. Yeah. Yes, so we'll have to be looking at much more qualitative in the future as well, not just quantitative. Um, Tom, this is hard to answer, I know, but we'd love your opinion on it. Which platform do you think will be the predominant long-term in your opinion? That, I, yeah, that, that is a really hard question. And t if I can be controversial, I think it's possibly the wrong question um, mm. because I, I don't think it matters. Um, it, it depends. These things change. It depends on who puts most money into their marketing budget of all the big providers, who's got most, um, most backing from other big businesses and who's had the biggest security breach recently i mean we know the zoom got a, uh, that had a lot of stick over lockdown for security issues and even now like my organization says we're not allowed to use zoom because it's got bad security this isn't the case i mean they've fixed everything now it's it's no less secure than anything else but it, it depends on reputation and things like that but again i it doesn't matter because they're all pretty much the same um underneath the underneath the, the the funny colors and the and the interface and things like that they do the same things and anything that does something that's worthwhile the other ones will adopt fairly quickly and anything that does something flash that the other ones don't adopt is a gimmick that won't catch on anyway so uh yeah sorry if that sounds like ducking the question but i yeah i i, I genuinely think it it's not worth thinking about because it'll change over time anyway. So if you invest in one now, it won't be the favorite in, in 18 months time. No, I think that's an excellent answer. And thank you as well for in your presentation, addressing Zoom, Google, all, all the different um, methods of presenting. That was really great. Um, Miranda, my question for you is, um, you know, we're very interested with you uh, working at a larger museum. If, if, if people are interested in bringing large groups to the museum currently, um, and if they are, what kind of um, security measures you might be taking for facilitators if, if they're wearing masks, even if the teachers and students are not, et cetera. So I'll answer the second part of that first, which is all of our staff are wearing um, at their discretion, I, so everyone has to wear a face covering and they can choose either, you know, a cloth face covering that covers their nose and mouth or a visor. My, my personal preference would be people to wear visors because I think you can communicate better, but if a staff member feels safer with a cloth face covering, they can wear that instead. Um, also following, you know, the, the mandatory guidance, um, now all of our visitors, um, over the age of 11 need to be wearing face coverings unless they've got an exemption. So that's um, how we are managing that. As I said, we're not having large group, we're not having primary school groups in just yet. So we haven't really had to deal with that under 11s bit. But so everyone's wearing face coverings. Um, in terms of larger groups, again, I uh, this is where I feel I'm still navigating. You know, I'm reading the Space for Learning COVID guidance and taking all the links that take me out to the different bits of government guidance. And, you know, at the moment, our rule is no groups bigger than six based on the kind of combination of you may meet six people from different households, you know, outside or two different households inside. I'm 
I'm feeling like I need to understand better when we can push that up higher for adult groups. But at the moment, six is the is the size of group we're accepting. So we are actually not having bigger groups than that. Right. We're having we've been having the local care home come in, which was unexpected to me. I thought they would be, you know, the last group who would feel safe to come in, but they were the first group who wanted to come in and we were their first out literally their first outing from the care home since March which felt like quite a responsibility but they all count as one household the staff and the and the residents there because so that you're not having to kind of social distance them in the same way so that it, which is what I mean by we're basically risk assessing kind of case by case for each type of activity at this stage right no that's a great answer thank you very much um, Rachel uh, let's, let's say, um, yeah, so we'll just do a little wrap up here. Yeah. Great. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this morning. It's been brilliant to meet you all. Um, and good luck with everything. Good luck with all your remote learning and your reopening. Um, please do let us know how you get on. Um, just to let you know, if you're not a GEM member, either as an institution or as an individual member, um, we have the training programme that I mentioned at the beginning, um, a number of publications. We have area reps. So the area rep in your area um, is actually Holly B, um, who used to be our learning um, and communications manager at GEM. Um, we also provide a jobs listing service. Conference, as I mentioned, is being postponed, but we're doing other events instead. And there is also a um, free um, GIS mail discussion group. If you're not part of that group, um, there's instructions on how to join it on our website. So, yeah, please do um, spread the word. If you know anybody that's currently a student or unwaged or at risk of redundancy, um, we have a special offer at the moment for just £25 to join GEM. So, um, yeah, keep in touch. And I think we've got a last slide just with our contact details and website details. So, and just lastly, thank you to Sarah and the team at the South East Museums Development Service for inviting us. We've really enjoyed um, delivering the session today. And thank you to our speakers, Hannah, Tom and Miranda. You've been amazing. And thanks for all your work preparing those um, really useful presentations for everybody.